Welcome to the Off the Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And I'm Dan. Uh, as always, we are still socially distant. We, we, we have done it. I mean, I feel like we were trendsetters because we were doing it back in December of last year. That's mm-hmm. literally just because Ross is in Connecticut. I'm in the Midwest. And, and Dan tonight's in the Pacific Northwest? Uh, yep, up in the Seattle area. Nice. I have a, I have a cousin in Seattle who spent a in my mind, enormous amount of money on a very sweet house. He is now gutting because it's over 100 years old and none of the plumbing or wiring is up to code. Yep, that's about how it works here. <laughs> fun project. Uh, to be honest, they started an Instagram account. And it's actually really kind of fun to follow along, mainly because I am not doing any of the hard work. Yeah, you're living by proxy. You're just seeing the good parts. You're not putting up with the zoning and the headaches and all that. Yeah, it's... They they realized they had, like, lead-based paint on the walls. Oh. But then, like, that wasn't an issue because they were going all the way to the studs anyway. So they didn't have to right. worry about the paint. They just had to wear, like, special masks while they got rid of Anyway, completely yeah. off topic. <laughs> like usual, we tangent very often. Sorry about As that. As tradition. <laughs> uh, the only industry news uh, is that the Broncos is good. Uh, good given the circumstances and I guess uh, what it's up against. I, I felt like the the reaction to everybody when we first saw Bronco and Bronco Sport was, well, the Bronco's the one to get. The Bronco Sport's, sport's adorable. Like, mm-hmm. no one's really going to want yeah. it. But then it seems like everyone who's driven it was like, hey, you know what? It's not bad. Right. It's the renegade to the Wrangler. Like, you want the Wrangler, but most people really need what the renegade or the Cherokee offers. And it, I don't know, it seems like people are actually reviewing it quite well, which is a nice surprise. What's the uh, Trailhawk? Is that the Cherokee package that gets you the, yes. your favorite? Red, yeah. The red toe hooks, yeah. Yeah, yeah Dan, <laughs> we have a thing about, a running joke about red toe hooks and how that's like the faux off-roader wannabe thing. Yeah, so. nice. And I, I think we could include red toe hooks now with the, the orange clearance lights on the front of everything. Yes. Uh, the Raptor. It, yeah, Raptor, and then people put them on the Ranger, and then people put them on the Tacoma and the Forerunner, and I think I've seen them on GM vehicles. It's like, okay, we get it. Yeah, they're everywhere. Right. The Raptor has to have them because of how wide it is. And it, it was original on the Raptor, so yeah, like it's, it's still kind of you know a, a marker trait of the Raptor. Uh, but. Yes. Yeah, it was a requirement. They had mm-hmm. to have, right? But I don't know. Bronco Sport. I look forward to seeing them on the street. I genuinely don't anticipate ever coming across one on the trail. That's kind of where it starts and ends for me. <laughs> it, it reminds me very much of uh, going to Camp Jeep and uh, following a, a first generation Jeep Liberty down. Oh boy, KJ the trails, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I mean. We joked the whole time that it was just a diet Jeep that was there, a Jeep light that was just out there with us. Um, But it did everything everyone else did. It just did it a little more precariously. Yeah, it had. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they had like a true low range transfer case prior to Cherokee becoming front drive based. Um, Dan, you're you're full Toyota, right? You haven't dabbled in the Jeep world at all, have you? Yeah, no, I'm totally Toyota here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Gotta, yeah. You're, Tacoma you're a good full runner. We just. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. So, all right, we'll we'll stick to the, uh, the stuff we know then. <laughs> um, so Chris has been. Uh, is that a dog in the background? It's fuzzy. It, I don't know. it is. It's the dog chewing on the bone. I'm going to throw it out the door. <laughs> the dog or the bone? I hopefully uh, hopefully not the dog. Um, yeah, Dan. We I don't know how much you know, but. Chris is a Toyota off-road and 4x4 and, I mean, just crossover and SUV family. And I've, I, as much as I grew up with Jeeps, I'm fully Toyota for the 4x4s yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But, yeah, my dad, my dad had Jeeps uh, all the time I was growing up and is still mm-hmm. a Jeep guy. But, uh, but he's now, I call it the Jeep limo because it's a Grand Cherokee and he likes the comfort of those those things now. <laughs> that is literally my dad's story. 
That's <laughs> yeah. So when I when growing up, I mean, I grew up. The reason I'm into off roading is he had a lifted YJ. You know, like nice. pretty heavily modified. He always jokes that it it didn't work more than it worked, but that was that was what got us into off roading, and then that was what introduced me to cars and off roading. Yeah. And now he has a Grand Cherokee. He dailies a Grand Cherokee. He fucking loves the thing. And he leaves the off-roading to the side-by-sides <laughs> because, <right. laughs> because you can throw it on a trailer and not have to, you know, worry about like drive shafts popping out on the trail as, yeah. as is why Jay liked to do. Yep. No, no, <laughs> but you're Chris, you're looking at something also I, kind of off-road and uh, family carrying limo-y. Well, so, for 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 Dan's sake, uh, Dan, I just recently sold my eighty series Land Cruiser because uh, I I have four kids, um, and as great as that thing was, it was just not ideal for latching and car seats. Still, literally because it's built before the latch systems, uh, and so I, I'm rocking an 08 Sequoia, which I, I had out in Southern Utah back in October and loved everything about it on the highway getting out there. Um, didn't spend a ton of time off road. I need to put some more like uh, protective elements on it to go play in the the trails and the rocks Belly's out there. Ball. Yeah, uh, there was one road when we were at the North Rim, and we were like, "Hey, we want to go that way." And the park ranger like looked down at the tr- truck and then looked back up at me in the driver's seat and was like, "Yeah, you shouldn't go down that road." <laughs> uh, he was like, "Minimum twelve inches of ground clearance is what we suggest for that." I was like, "Oh." Yeah, we're not that. Even at the high setting of the adjustable suspension, we are not at 12 inches. So um, I don't think I'm going to build it into like an off-road monster. I, I really think I'm going to keep it fairly fairly stock height-ish. But I have been spiraling down a rabbit hole of travel trailers. Um, oh, yeah. And the self-contained element, um, the ability to throw solar on it and have battery power in the woods... Um, my wife and, and daughter are very on board with the uh, on board bathroom. That's not just like <laughs> not a bucket. The 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 glorified. Oh man, Year, years ago I did a camp out with a, a, a I mean it was a youth group and the restroom facilities were literally a bucket with a toilet seat on top. And as we prepared for that camp out, everyone found out that's what the bathroom was, and they were like, "Nope, I'm out." <laughs> like, oh. Sorry, guys. So uh, the travel trailers are just like, I almost, I've started contacting companies and be like, can I talk to a marketing person? Because I feel like I have way more questions than they have the ability to address online. Mm-hmm. Cause like, what's the, so the, there, there are like four major companies that build everything. Does right. Make sense. Mm-hmm. So forest rivers, one of them. Uh, and then I think one's called Thor Industries. It's kind of cool. That that's who owns Airstream. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I again didn't know that. <laughs> um, but they have. Where was the brand? Stupid mobile. But these are. I mean, they're all generally they're on road travel trailers, or are they geared for off road? Because. So I've, I've been down the rabbit hole of the off-road ones, and as much as I love the way they look, um, none of them seem to have enough versatility to sleep six or seven of us. Okay. I mean, you could probably get away with it with, like, a small one and then a rooftop tent on that, and a rooftop tent on the Sequoia, too. Right. Well, I've got the Thule box up there right now, so mm. it's on the way. Um, so I found one that was, like, a single axle and you do you remember uh when we talked to the, the owner of brio Ross? yes yeah so and he talked about his which was a forest river right Cherokee Wolf, uh, it had like six names yeah and and that's the problem i've been running into these things is like the brand name will change but the like model name will be the same you're like wait what the heck is going on so like so it's the same shell they just outfit it with different stuff and call it the same thing based on the size Pretty much okay. so like the floor plans, the, the all the new alphanumeric floor plans are like the same crap. So like the one I'm looking at is a FSX 178 BHSK. Wow. They made that easy. Yeah, exactly. 
So uh, basically what it means is the cabin itself where you're living is like 17 to 18 feet long. The overall, mm -hmm. the entire length of it's just short of 23 feet. So, oh, that's not bad. Including not the massive. tongue? Huh? Including the tongue? Uh, yes, the exterior length includes the tongue. Um, I hope so. Because so. <laughs> I haven't seen one that goes like tongue <laughs> At length. another three feet. <laughs> yeah, like, and that might be the case. Um, but like, the one I'm looking at, the uh, dry weight is 3,700 pounds. It's got a, a, another 1,000 pounds of cargo capacity mm -hmm. in it. So I'm still looking at under 5,000 pounds. Awesome. Um, the, the Sequoia is rated for like 8.8 eight to 9.1. Um, I haven't been able to lock down a firm number there, maybe because it's a 2008, which is kind of mm -hmm. weird. Um, Email Toyota. There's a, a Toyota rep who can like pull the VIN and tell you exactly what it is. Exactly what it is. Yeah. So, uh, and I think I have free email. I only know that because of the importing process for the white forerunner. When yeah. it came from Canada to the U.S., I had to provide the um, customs agency with like everything, really? and that was one of them. Yeah. Yeah. So the one that I I kind of I, I use the phrase lusting after because these things are not cheap is. It's got double bunk beds in the back, which I, the reason I brought up the guy from Brio is his was twin bunk beds in the back and a queen bed in the front. Mm. Um, so this has double bunks in the back, uh, a queen size Murphy bed in the front, which was where I would sleep. And then it has actually a slide out for only being 17 feet long. It actually has a slide out. Mm. Um, and that's where the U shape uh, dinette is. And that'll also turn into what's basically a double size bed. That's pretty cool. So I'm like, Four kids through double bunks, dinette if we need it, queen bed. Doable. Yeah. And so you can get them with heaters and AC units. With a self contained generator, or does he have to like plug into? See, that's that's the that's how you in you spiral down this and there's no like you know when you go to a, an auto manufacturer, you can just be like, Yes, I want this package and I want those wheels and I want this color. Generally. Nobody, no, <laughs> No trailer company has a website like that. They're like, this is what we make. This is what's available. If you want to special order something, you can have it in 2022. Okay. They're all That's, kind of backed up. <laughs> yeah, life might be normal by then. Yeah. And it's just, I feel like we need to find some more contacts in that world to get yeah. a little more research. I don't think they do press trailers, which is kind of sad. Uh, that's too bad yeah i know i've seen like press camper versions before but never press trailers right yeah so but to to like inv really investigate if i want to if we want to head down that path you can there's like uh turo for rvs yep um rv share rv outdoors. share yeah we were looking at that this year for one of the failed off-road one of the atv trips we were going to take up north we didn't want to stay in a hotel or a motel or do anything like that and we looked into the rv share stuff it's pretty cool i mean it's it's literally airbnb yeah so the amount of trailers that i just saw like parked along the road in random spots in southern utah was just kind of like mm. all right i get it guys like you leave that there you go do what you want to do that day and you go right back to your trailer and yeah self-contained a lot of them were like tucked down into little box canyons and stuff just like mm -hmm. you set up home base and then circle back that's, yeah. that's pretty cool i don't i don't need a toy hauler you would need the toy hauler. yeah that's never gonna happen <laughs> no chance tell the kidney it'll be all right <laughs> yeah right anybody buying so that's <laughs> literally i have spent way too much time on the internet looking at those stupid things mm -hmm. um, Actually, remember when we, uh, and this, man, I don't know why I'm pulling all this up now. When we talked to Jonathan with Brio, we talked about the possibility of like switching on an axleless. Yes. Uh, that I, I do. Yep. I reached out to, to that company, it was called Timberin. So I reached out to them so I could talk to their like suspension guy, and he hasn't got back to me yet. So if he's listening, <laughs> still want to maybe talk to he's, you. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe he's, I don't know, still fall from Thanksgiving or something. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, yeah anyway that's all i got all right well keep us posted other than that my oldest got one of the seatbelts stuck in the sequoia so i still haven't got that unstuck yet so stuck how i like the belt is stuck in the receptacle or like so yeah and it's stuck at its 
fully extended thing. So there's no give in the seatbelt whatsoever yep. to try to get it unstuck. Yep. And I, I, I didn't say nice things to him. I wasn't horrible, but I was just like, when you're pulling, mm -hmm. why did you keep pulling? <laughs> like, if it's not going back in, you don't continue to keep pulling then. Like, it's usually like a 10 millimeter socket to take the, the buckle out of the floor. And then you can just play with it there. WD-40 goes a long way. Well, that's, I don't need to undo it from the floor because I have like four and a half feet of slack right now. So it's just going to be oh. like feeding it. Back. <laughs> the, the yeah. Is, uh, oh, oh, oh. A butter knife and maybe some. And it's because it's the adjustable height one. Like it's not fully exposed. Like just mm -hmm. back in the that's going to be fun. Off with the pillar. Yeah. 12 year old plastic and side airbags and all the kind mm -hmm. of stuff that I want to mess with. Yikes. That's fun. <laughs> happens <laughs> so my own updates nothing super substantial the winter wheels and tires went on the Miata this week which is always said um, we replaced the belt that was squealing like crazy on the forerunner so Dan just to fill you in I very very recently bought Chris's 05 forerunner um, it's, okay. a, it's a V8 yep 4.7 uh, it's got 268 and change on it and it started developing like a pretty high pitch squeal that was serpentine belt on tensioner so i work at a at a service department so i i asked one of my friends you know mind helping me during lunch one day so we pulled the truck in <laughs> we looked at it we figured out what we needed and then it, it was kind of like the yeah this should take 20 minutes we'll still have time to get lunch conversation and then <laughs> Now it's a couple of weeks later. <laughs> well, no. So well, I mean, we, we thought it was going to be twenty minutes, and the next day we we started at at twelve and finished at two. So to get the serpentine belt off, you can actually snake it around the fan, which was nice because I thought the whole fan was going to have to come off after we started. But it was to get the tensioner off. You have to remove both parts of the timing cover. To get the timing cover off, you have to take the bottommost bolt out for the power steering. Um, you have to take the alternator out to get that bolt out for the power steering. And then you have to take the pulley off the power steering in order to get the whole thing to come apart. Yeah. Um, and, you know, given 15 year old truck with a bunch of miles. So it was uh, it was a process. And yeah. there were a lot of uh, a lot of not family friendly words. <laughs> said. People kept walking over us going, what the hell are you guys doing? And it was like it just it was one thing after another, but now it yeah. makes no noise and it's silent. And, uh, and now I'm, you know, looking at skid plates and armor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. Well, at least it sounds easier than a first gen Tacoma or third gen forerunner where you're taking out the radiator and all that to do that job. So that's, that's not a fun job to, to flip Just the for timing a belt on a V6. Yep. Of oh, timing belt. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Which is, a, you know, that's the serpentine belt basically on the first right. gen Tacoma. Yeah. Oh God, that's I'm sure that's fun. Oh, um, it's uh, it's a day process for sure. <laughs> oh, false. Jesus. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, uh, sounds similar to, and I know you didn't get to the sixteen rocks, but it sounds like the Audi service position that has to be achieved <laughs> to do anything on an Audi engine. Yeah, the um, the V eight S fours. Yeah, it's like automatic fifteen hundred bucks just to achieve service yeah. position. <laughs> yeah, it's like ten hours to get the back of the motor down so you can change the belts because they put the belts on the back by the firewall. But exactly. yeah, so the forerunner's good now. Um, I ordered a head unit from Crutchfield since there's no other way to add Bluetooth. So that's sitting in a box about four feet from me, and now I just have to gather the courage to, you know work outside since i don't have a garage and it's like 35 degrees um other than that i have no updates you can swing it by we can put it in the garage for a little bit <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe next year <laughs> maybe i'll uh, i'll save something to repair on it in your garage on on a trip west next year <laughs> <laughs> hey sarah um it's, it's bad <laughs> so we uh yeah we alluded to it but our guest is dan of Adventure Taco uh, fame, I guess. Um, notoriety. I don't whatever. know about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the long and the short of it is. A lot of the Facebook pages that I am or Facebook groups that I'm a part of, I'm like, damn, here he went again. 
Yeah, um, and I stumbled upon you on Tacoma World with the trip reports. So tell us about yourself. Yeah. How did you get into off-roading? What, uh, what are you off-roading? What yeah. kind of trips have you been on? Yeah, um, boy, so let's see. I'll start with uh, people probably care more about that. Uh, <clears throat> um, I drive uh, most of the time a first-gen Tacoma, a 2000 Tacoma extra cab. Um, and, uh, and then we also, uh, in the summer when the, or my daughter's out of school, uh, we also have a third gen forerunner. Uh, so we'll take that, um, cause it allows for sleeping in the back. And then we'd throw the tent from the Tacoma up on the roof of the forerunner and we've got, uh, sleeping for the adults upstairs. Cool. So, um, so yeah, so some older vehicles, but, uh, you know, I like that they're, nice and narrow and relatively easy to maintain and, and, uh, you know, fewer electronics than you got in the, the current mm -hmm. versions. So you've gotten pretty um, accustomed to tinkering with them. <laughs> I'm guessing not only, uh, not only at home when you have free time, but also on the trail. Yeah. Um, definitely, uh, a lot of tinkering both times. I think, um, you know, I've really, I've been pretty lucky myself. Um, oh yeah, there's, there's a picture of it. Great. Um, I've been lucky myself and haven't had a ton of trouble with the truck on the trail, but, uh, but definitely on group trips, there's been plenty of tinkering that's gone on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, uh, how I got started, um, let's see. Well, so we talked a little bit at the beginning, um, you know, my dad had, a had Jeeps, uh, my, mm -hmm entire childhood and uh and we would go camping not in the jeeps but in a, a chevy station wagon nice. <laughs> uh, wait you know so, off, off to campgrounds <laughs> in the in the chevy wagon and not that's in right. the four by four <laughs> that's right and uh and you know as a kid i had a great time doing that and going fishing and, and just really being outside and so um as i got older i continued to like the camping um but took a took a pretty long break from from doing it, uh, you know, life sort of got in the way. Uh, eventually, um, what was it? I don't know, four years ago now, five years ago now, um, I started getting the itch. I think I found Tacoma World for some reason. I was like putting new tires on the Tacoma or something. And uh, and I saw all these guys there like posting trip reports and and going out and, and uh, having a great time. And uh, that was also... Um, well, so when I put on the, the tires, I also started looking at other things because uh, once you're on Tacoma World, it's really hard not to. <laughs> As you do. It's like the and, uh, black hole for there's always more. That's right. Exactly. And um, so uh, I think I saw somebody went on a backcountry discovery route. There's these you know routes that go generally north to south through a bunch of the western states. And, um, and I sort of got a bee in my bonnet about doing Oregon. And so we sort of looked into, um, into what, what was entailed in doing that. Um, put a few more things on the Tacoma, did that Oregon backcountry discovery route, um, and, uh, and got pretty well hooked, I would say. And, <laughs> how many uh, miles and how many days did it take you to run that one? Yeah, that one I think is, uh, something right around 900 miles. Um, obviously, you know, it goes from the very Northern border of California there to, uh, to Walla Walla, Washington. And, um, took us, I think about a week, maybe six days, uh, to do that. Um, and, uh, and most of it, you know, most of the, the backcountry discovery routes are, are relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, especially as you get sort of more and more experience they're they're generally pretty good roads. I mean, they're meant for, for motorcycle, motorcycle guys to go and, and they're not going to be going over, you know, huge rocks or anything like that for the most part. Uh, but it turned out, and, and most of it for us was okay. Uh, it did turn out that on the very first day we got on a trail that, that was a single track, <laughs> Oh boy, <No>. a <laughs> motorcycle trail. And, uh, and I have a nice dent in the back of the Tacoma. Uh, as the trail got a little <laughs> narrow and we realized we needed to find a reroute. Trees um, aren't friendly to, no, to body that, panels. 
that, uh, you know, it's just part of the learning experience when you're new. And uh, it was nice to get that over with uh, in the yep. beginning. I haven't had any other sort of run-ins with trees since then. So <laughs> <laughs> try to keep it that way. That's right. Um, do, they, uh, do they maintain the backcountry discovery roads or is it kind of, they're most, I know they're mostly like fire road or just above fire road difficulty. Yeah. Are they, are they maintained or are they just kind of free-for-alls? They are generally not maintained. You know, a lot of them are forest service roads or, or dirt county roads. Um, so from that perspective, some of them get maintenance uh, that way. But there's not like the the group that creates the BDR. They don't go out and actually maintain um, uh, any of the the roads themselves. They they build the route and then publish it and hopefully it gets traffic. But, but there are, you know, year to year um, route updates because uh, roads will get closed or washed out. Um, uh, and so you sort of, <laughs> You got to be you got to be ready to, to reroute, yeah. Yeah, um, you go on those. So I did that, and then uh, then I went on a two week long trip with a bunch of guys on Tacoma World. Um, sort of the oh my gosh, you know, met some people on the internet and going to go out in the middle of the woods <laughs> with them. Right. That's always fun. That first and, time we've uh, done the same got thing. In a parking lot, and you're like, all right, so I'm gonna. I, there's like a slight chance I'm gonna have to rely on these people I've never met before. That's right. And there's also you know going to be in a remote place with these people eh, you have that like little hesitancy and then you go oh well fuck it yep yep and it turned out great and uh and those guys are now you know a lot of them i call really good friends so uh so that turned out to be great and um and from there boy it just sort of snowballed so i, I probably do a trip a month now uh oh. and um and maybe spend 80 or 90 nights in the tent a year uh, which is which is pretty great, uh, and of course that then means that you have to get more and more into what's the truck situation and is it outfitted for all that. So uh, a bunch of time, a bunch of time doing that as well. But it's great fun, and I get to see a lot of really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's certainly, I mean, from what single individual reports you've written alone, it seems like you've seen. I mean. So more than most people even know exists in the off-road world. And that, that group you were talking about, too, it seems like you've also developed a pretty good core group that likes to run together and, and tends to do well off-road together, too. Yeah, it's been really great. You know, they were the a, a lot of that group was together sort of before I ever became part of that group. And uh, they mo most of the group also has uh, first gen sort of mm -hmm. how they became a group. And um and and they're a great core set of guys and and then there's a bunch of other guys um who join here and there on various trips and and uh you know we we do um well some of the trips we we go and arrange just in the group but uh, a bunch of the trips we organize you know on tacoma world so if other mm -hmm. folks are interested in joining uh there's usually a slot or two uh you know at any time during a two-week trip that that other people can join as well Mm -hmm. yeah it's pretty wild how i mean not just Tacoma world but the off-road websites kind of create this hub for people to meet up like i've gone on you know there's been a few tacoma world like end of the season runs and there's 50 or 60 trucks that meet up and they you know break into groups but it's also been like three of us from the site yeah yeah the i've never been on anything with more than i think uh eight or nine guys 50 or 60 seems so unwieldy to me you know, I know Don't how recommend. much longer eight or nine <laughs> guys take to go on a trail compared to one or two. Mm -hmm. um, man, 50, that would be... That it's would an be exponential, exponential. Yeah, increase. I can imagine. <laughs> so you've nailed the first-gen Tacoma situation pretty well. Um, and, and you've also spent probably, I mean, given a third of the year or so in a tent off-road <laughs> every yeah. year. Um, you've kind of figured it out. So, I mean... Not to scoop ourselves, we do. We always run a section that we try to do every episode about like our you know off road tips and tricks. Yeah. But for the overlanding type of travel, where you really are doing what it is by definition and not like the quote unquote Instagram, you know, where somebody like has seventy five thousand dollars worth of crap on a truck and just posts a picture of them in the woods, but actually spends time making their setup and 
and living out of it and being completely self-contained and self-sufficient. What have you found to be like the key elements and what has like really led you to where you are? Yeah, well, so let's see. I think um, one of the things that I sort of lucked out uh, falling into was um, the first the first trip that I went on, you know, there were a bunch of other guys who brought all the stuff that was necessary. I probably didn't have to bring anything on that trip. And, uh, and I would have been just fine. And so, um, I always tell people now the the best way to prepare for a trip is to sort of like get the stuff you think you'll need and then go on the trip. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, and, and what you'll, you'll find out the things you forgot to bring (laughs) usually (laughs) very, and you'll know you'll need in the next trip. So, um, but, but, you know, I think if you're sort of looking at, at doing this, um, uh, for sure, there are a few things you're going to need. You're going to need um, some good tires, right? Like the the most common thing I think that happens on the trail is that somebody gets a flat, um, and uh, and that's fine. You know, as long as you've got a spare, and uh, you know the spare holds air, uh, a flat is no big deal. Um, it is reasonably always... close to the same size. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, uh, so, you know, having a spare tire and, and generally, you know, I feel like a way to air up your tires. Uh, I think if you're doing this, uh, over any amount of distance, you really want to be aired down. Um, that doesn't mean you have to go buy the dual ARB compressor for 500 bucks or whatever it is, you know, uh, you can get, you can get a single for less, you know, way less than that. And, and you can even, you know, get one of the little standalone units that you walk around to each tire. That's what I use. Yeah, because I it mean, it's like 45 <laughs> bucks. <laughs> totally fine. And, you know, a lot of people, um, uh, you know, even the more experienced people are like, boy, they, I don't know, they give me a hard time because I've got, you know, the single ARB. And so it mm-hmm. takes me 20 minutes to air up my tires and it takes them five or 10 minutes with a duel. And right. I'm like, look, man, like 20 minutes in the overall scheme of a two week trip yeah. is really not that big of a deal. It's not. And also if there's like three people standing around who are done airing up their tires, they can move their trucks and air up one of yours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, it's not like, it's not like we don't all like talking to each other anyway. Right. That's so exactly. if we're there yeah. for a few extra minutes, we've already stopped for three hours during the day to take photos. So what's another, <laughs> another few minutes. How um, frequently do you guys, cause uh, you know, you seem to be joking about it more and more in the trip reports, but how like, I get criticized for stopping to take pictures because, you know, it holds up the group. Yeah. Usually. How yeah. often do you guys stop? Uh, we stop, I would say, pretty often to take photos. Um, uh, let's see. I, I generally end up in a sort of a day-long trip report. I'll end up posting something like 40 to 50 photos in, in that one day. Um, that's probably... Uh, a quarter to a third of the photos that I took that day. So 200 photos. Um, uh, and you know, cause a bunch don't turn out well and that kind of thing. So, um, so you can imagine with 200 photos, we're stopping quite a bit. I would say, uh, you know, every 10 ish minutes we're, we're probably stopped, uh, doing one thing or another. A lot of times that's stopping at a place. Um, it's pretty rare that we pass up a mine or a cabin or, you know, some cool water feature, uh, without stopping or, or, you know, a nice overlook without stopping. Right. Um, and if, and everybody wants to stop at those and and sort of look around. Right. Um, stuff uh, like that. And this is just an observation from afar because I mean, the variety that we have of that kind of stuff in the Northeast is just not the same of what I've seen out West, but the way I look at it is you can either stop and this goes for off road on road kind of regardless. It's if you don't stop the next time you're there, it might be different. It might not be there. You might not be able to get there. It may never happen again. So that's exactly right. Yep. That's exactly right. Uh, there have definitely been times even where we know that we're doing sort of an out and back and we think, Oh, we'll, we'll check this thing out on the way back. And you know, one thing leads to another and then some road takes longer than we think. And it's dark on our way back Mm -hmm. or, um, you know, the, the sun has gone, you know, behind the clouds that are now blowing over. So, uh, right. we sort of have that same mindset of if we see something cool, let's stop unless we're in some, some huge rush. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, we also, um, you know, probably stop 
more often than most people just to take a picture <laughs> of whatever <laughs> road we're on. Um, right. And, uh, and some of those, it turns out, come out really nice and the, you don't even expect it. And so that's another thing that I think is, is um, sort of a nice side effect of our stopping is that we, we put ourselves in these situations that uh, you may just not even realize you're putting yourself in until... Mm -hmm you know, after the fact, when you're off looking at the photos you took and you go, oh, that turned out to be a really nice photo. We didn't right. even think it was going to be that great. Yeah. Right. So, so that kind of actually brings us to something I was curious about too. And I'm, I'm sure plenty of people listening are because you guys plan routes that, and this is, I'm sure carefully curated and you have endless and countless experience to draw on, but the routes that you plan always seem to have a good mix of kind of everything for the off-road stuff. What's your, yeah. uh, What's like the process that you guys go through? How do, like are there resources you use, or is this uh, like experience and kind of your own database you've aggregated? Yeah, so I think um, it sort of I'll go through sort of the process that I use. I think it's similar to the process that that a lot of the other guys in the group use as well. Um, uh, the The first thing is sort of figuring out the area you want to go. Uh, mm -hmm. In the west, you know, you mentioned uh, comparing the west to the the east and the northeast. I mean, it's it's easy they to find a place there. to go in the in the West. You can basically go anywhere, uh, and there's there's something cool to see. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, the first thing is figuring out an area, and then the next thing uh, for me anyway is some searches on the internet to sort of figure out what is in that area um, that could be worth seeing. And and I'll actually use a lot of times uh, image searches. Um, mm -hmm. And and just, you know, I'll type in the name of the area, go over to, to see what images come back. And, and if there's a cool looking thing, <laughs> I'll find out if it's actually in that area. Um, and so I never thought of that. Yeah. Like I, I've been doing stupid trips like, <laughs> you know, since I could drive and that never occurred to me. Yeah. So, you it's know, like, people take all kinds of pictures of really cool stuff. And if you just go look at the pictures of stuff, you can go, oh, that's really cool. You go look at the person's blog, you find out generally where it is. Um, and then, uh, and you know, you, you mark that on a map. So the map I use to mark stuff like that is Google earth. And I have for each, the way I do it is for each state, I've got a, a Google earth file. It's a KML or KMZ okay. file. Yep. Um, and they've got a bunch of pins in various places and, uh, and so, so I build up this sort of library of pins, and then I start figuring out routes between the pins. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and uh, and you can do that, you know, with Google Earth. Uh, you know, you can sort of trace along uh, what you can see in the satellite. Uh, there's some shortcuts to that as well, where you, it can sort of generate a to-from route for you, um, or you can use uh, Google My Maps will sort of do driving directions for you, and you can import that back into Google Earth. Um, and so, and so you sort of figure out, um, uh, what the cool things are to see, uh, what the routes are between those things. Um, I then often, once I sort of figure out the routes, I start looking for, um, uh, what named places along those routes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then I'll do another search on the internet for, for those places. Um, because, you know, oftentimes you search for, I don't know, uh, ghost towns near and then some city in Nevada, right? right. <laughs> and, and you'll get a hit, you know, 10 or 15 hits of, of ghost towns nearby. And so you can sort of look and see, are they actually close by? Can I add those to the route? Uh, can I tweak the route a little bit? Go. That's right. Um, and, and it's sort of an iterative process there uh, to get to a route that looks like a fun route that, you know, you think you want to do in a however long you have to do it. Um, you never have long enough, so <laughs> <laughs> ain't that the truth? So, so then it becomes sort of you do part of that route, and then you've got a great starting point for the next trip or some trip in the future. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so that's that's my general yeah. mode of route planning. I also, um, uh, you know, with the backcountry discovery routes, uh, someone else has created those routes. So you can sort of jump into that process right in the middle. You have a route already, and you just start searching for things around it. Um, I, I generally think the backcountry discovery routes are good to get from place to place, but they're not always the most interesting on the actual route. 
Um, some of the most interesting things we saw, we ran uh, the Nevada route this last mm -hmm. year, this last summer. And uh, some of the most interesting things we saw were, were when we took side trips off of the route to, uh, yep. to go see something that we'd found. Side quest. Yep. yep. <laughs> okay. Do you tailor the trips based on the vehicles and people, or you kind of just say, this is what we're going to do. We all have the same frame of mind going for it. Or is there any like, I, uh, I, yeah. So I, I think we do do a little bit of tailoring, um, uh, depending on who's there or not there, we might do more or less hiking kind okay. of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, some people really like hiking. Some people aren't super fond of it. Um, and so we'll, we'll okay. figure out, uh, you know, is there an eight mile hike in the middle of driving one day? <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, uh, but as far as sort of trail difficulty goes, um, the nice thing is that most of us are generally comfortable in the same sort of range of trail. Mm -hmm. um, uh, our trucks are all equipped reasonably similarly. Okay. Um, and so we don't have a lot of, of sort of some people wanting to go do a bunch of rock crawling and other guys just wanting to do forest service roads kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, there are times where we sort of uh, question trails. So one of the things we've been talking about doing is Rubicon. Um, a bunch really? of us want to do Rubicon, okay. uh, but on Tacomas with 33 inch tires, uh, we're going to be using every piece of armor we have and hoping to make it through. Um, <laughs> yeah, that would be, so, tough. uh, you know, <clears throat> um, what we're, we haven't done it yet. <laughs> And there's a couple of guys who are sort of figuring out like, okay, do I want to put 35s on before I do that? And, uh, and, and change uh, all the shit that goes along with it. That's right. That's right. And so, um, so there are discussions about, about certain trails, you know, some guys don't love the, the what, shelf roads that, that drop way off. Um, and so we might, uh, we might avoid those if we can in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but in general, I think we all, we all have the, the attitude of we'll go, we'll give it a try. If we're uncomfortable at the time, we can always find a reroute. That's true. Yeah, that's true. You don't have to do an obstacle just because it's there. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And that's one of the great things, uh, it, at least in our group is that, um, you know, sometimes there's an obstacle and there's a, a, uh, a bypass to the obstacle and there's not really any, any judgment. There might be some some uh ribbing that goes on if somebody takes a, a bypass but but by and large mm. everybody's really cool and everybody mm. that i've ever been wheeling with has been really cool about just saying do what you're comfortable with and if yeah. you're not comfortable with something uh you know it, it takes experience to get comfortable and uh if you're not there yet that's totally fine mm -hmm. and the day will come when you are that's right especially because like if they try the obstacle and mess something up it could ruin the whole day for her. Right. Oh yeah. The more than worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they can, it can end a trip for him. You know what I mean? So yeah. Like I'm fully on board with workarounds. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's definitely something where, where if you're with a group of folks who aren't, aren't sort of that way and they're sort of really actually not, not giving you sort of the space to be comfortable with how you want to drive it, that that might be an indicator for me to go find another group of guys to to drive yeah, i mean yeah. like you said there's always some jesting and you know some poking of of good fun if somebody opts out of something that you that the group cohesively knows they could have done yeah but i mean ultimately you know a big problem mechanically or psychologically is a lot worse than, than taking a bypass. That's right. That's right. So, so yeah. So anyway, I think, uh, you know, getting a truck together to, to go do that and having one that, that meets whatever you need. Um, it's something where you just start, uh, you start with what you've got. And so I would, I always recommend to people start with a stock Tacoma mm -hmm. if, if that's what you've got, or, you know, a stock Jeep, if that's what you got, uh, if, if, yeah. or a forerunner, I mean, if you have a stock vehicle, you probably haven't gotten a lot of experience um, uh, doing this. And so probably already your truck is more capable than you are as a driver. Uh, go drive. Yep. Drive where you're comfortable. You'll find places that you're not comfortable. And, and eventually you'll get comfortable with those. And you go, oh, you know what? Like, 
I was pretty comfortable going over those rocks, but I wasn't quite sure about the truck. So maybe I'll put some, you know, skid plates or sliders or something right. on the truck and go from there. Um, the things that, that uh, I tell people to start with as far as, as mods aren't actually the vehicle mods. They're more the like comfort mods. So mm -hmm. for me, the, the two biggest mods that I've done um, or the two most valuable mods were getting a fridge. Uh, that just changed the way I could camp. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't have to worry that, you know, in two days, my food isn't going to be good anymore because my ice will have all melted. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have to worry that my bread was going to be soggy. <laughs> right. Are you uh, on single battery or dual batteries? So for three years, um, I was on single battery and it was just fine. You know, all the fridges have a built in um, uh, voltage cutoff. Yeah. And so uh, I, ha you know, I relied on that and a, one of those little lithium ion uh, jump starter kits and, and that's great, right? Like you're pretty things sure are <laughs> you can get your truck going again. And once your truck's going, then you can charge up your battery with the alternator and, uh, and the fridge, you know, if the fridge doesn't run all night, that's no big deal. Uh, nights in most places, uh, are cool enough that, uh, not running overnight, you know, might get up to 40, 45 in the fridge, but that's fine. Right. That's like, fine. That's no big deal if you're going to turn it on again in a few hours. So you're not going to spoil anything in. in that's right. Hours. Yeah. So the fridge is a uh, a big one for me, and then the other one um, that it took a few years to get, but now I tell everybody right away: uh, look for a really comfortable mattress, because <clears throat> uh, good sleep on a trip for some people is really hard to come by. Um, whether it's in an RTT or on the ground, a good mattress can go a long way. Uh, to just get you, getting you rested and, and ready for the next day. I mean, if you're going day after day right. uh, and driving, you know, at least the way we do, where we're sort of up in the, up in the morning with the sun and into camp <laughs> in yep. the evening with the sunset, um, you have to have a lot of energy to do that. And, uh, and getting a good night's sleep is, a, is an important thing there. Mm -hmm. So having a really good mattress, I, um, I found... Um, an Xped mattress, Xped Mega Mat, which is, it's not a cheap mattress. It's like 350 bucks or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is, it is well You're spending worth every a third penny. of the year on it though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I would say, I would say, um, you know, even if you're just spending like weekends in the summer, uh, it's, it's totally worth it. Um, you know, the, I guess you can say this about any individual mod, but you've got a truck that's like thousands and thousands of bucks. And you're you're doing things to it with tire, you know, it's like a couple tires is three hundred and fifty bucks. So, um, I don't know, a good mattress and a good night's sleep seem worth it to me. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of like the invest in yourself thing, you know. Yeah. The same way who how I don't know if you're like a, a guy or, or girl or woman or anybody who's huge into track days. If your seat's uncomfortable and you're going to run four sessions a day, like that's it's just not going to work out. <laughs> that's right. Know? Yep. Yep. But one of the things that, that we, Chris and I love to harbor on, and I'm sure you've dabbled with prior to the Tacoma coming to the state that it's been, is people just don't understand what their vehicle is actually capable of in, in its most primitive base form, like the way it was designed and engineered from the factory. Yeah. And I don't know, we always talk about go out there, try stuff, do stuff, and then find the weakness and, you know, and build from there. Don't just, you know, say, okay, I need... 33s or 35s and and do that because you might not or you might need more yeah and it's that's a great it's a great thing to say to people um because the reality you know like i said is is most of the time the the vehicle is more capable than the driver uh at, at the beginning there and and like you said like maybe you need, you're gonna need 33s but maybe you're not you know like are you a go fast guy because if you are then more than the size of tires is maybe the suspension. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to be somebody who, you know, you find that what you really like to do is you like to go drive out in the middle of nowhere, park the park the vehicle, and then do a bunch of hikes, uh, you know, so you're sort of base camp and then you come back. Like at that point, maybe the thing you want is a solar setup so that you can run the fridge while you're off hiking because right. you don't have the alternator running to charge the, you know, charge the battery and keep the fridge going. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what if you're doing rock crawling, you're going to need a whole different setup than if you're doing just regular, you know, sort of forest service road overlanding. 
Um, and so figuring out what you like is going to tell you how to modify that vehicle way more than, than doing it. You know, there are some guys that I've, that I've said to, said to them, like, just get out there. Cause they've spent three or four years saying, oh, I'm almost ready to go. And they're just building, uh, I just, building. I just have building. three more mods to do, and then I'm going to be ready to go. Right. Um, and wow. boy, I mean, I, there's it's fun building a truck, but uh, if you actually are building the truck to get out there, then then get out there. Right. Is yeah. this like if if somebody was like, "Yep, I got, I'm going on a big hike. I got boots. I got a backpack, and then they have everything, and it's years later, and you're like, but did you go yet? And they yeah. say, like, come on. Yeah. But no, I mean, it makes sense. And then, I mean. So you guys are pretty good and armored up, um, skids and sliders and bumpers. Everybody runs a winch generally. Uh, let's see. We are. Um, I, I would say everybody wants to be running a winch, um, and everybody <laughs> wants to have sl sliders and skids. Um, we actually the 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 group runs with about fifty percent of folks having uh, winches, mm -hmm. um, and about fifty percent of folks having skids, and everybody's got sliders. Okay. Um, so, uh, skids, it turns out, um, what, if you're good at line choice, skids are less necessary. Um, and some of the guys who have a lot of experience, uh, you know, they get by with either just the, uh, the stock skids or, um, mm. or just really careful line choice, mm. uh, and, and some rock movement if necessary. Um, uh, and, and as far as winches go, uh, you know, the winch is generally, we have found you never winch yourself out. It's always to winch a buddy out. So mm -hmm. as long as we've got, um, half the vehicles with winches, we're, when we get ourselves in situations where we think we might need one, we then sort of, uh, rejigger <laughs> the order of the group so that we've got somebody with a winch going first and somebody Staggered. with a winch going last. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, just so everybody doesn't have to have one. It's one of the things that, uh, that we've talked about just in general is like, um, how do you, how do you get a group of people together, um, in such a way that you're as efficient as you can be? And so, you know, uh, not just with winches, but like, mm -hmm. does everybody need a high lift? Probably not. Um, does everybody, you know, okay. if you're all first gen Tacomas, do you all need to bring a spare alternator, a spare CV, you know, a spare pair of lower ball joints. Right. No, you don't, right? Like you can split some yeah. of that stuff up. Then everybody's wildly overloaded and, and it's just excess on excess and you don't need that's it. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so we started doing some of that as well, where we, um, we sort of coordinate across the group and bring, you know, we might bring two high lifts or something so that they're, you know, if one breaks, we're okay. But, uh, but we're trying to bring less and less stuff just because mm -hmm. the truck's, they get heavy and heavy trucks are harder to drive. Uh, going through more gas, <laughs> going through more gas, harder on the vehicle, you know, things are starting to crack. So, um, yeah. yeah. And, and gravity, I mean, gravity is gravity, more weight and it, it just makes it more difficult going up and going down. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, sorry, I found a picture of some dude belly flopping into a lake. Uh, I uh, maybe <laughs> it's on your site, so I hope so. <laughs> Let's see. Oh yeah, so this was uh this was actually not a, a truck trip so much as it was a, a hike uh, here in Washington. Uh, we hiked up to to some alpine lakes that we have, and uh, this was I don't know that guy at all, but there was this exactly. group of folks who had hiked up there, and uh, and he was jumping into the lake, and yeah. He, I'm not sure where he landed, but that was a cold lake. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, everybody in that picture is like coat and pants. Like, it doesn't look like warm water. Yeah. I, I know where he landed. <laughs> oh. Yeah, there's, there's this landing. I'm just not sure if he was. A, yeah, an action on his shot belly at his. Or not. Yeah. yeah. Jesus, that probably felt terrible. <laughs> it was a belly flop, too. Like, it's cold and like he's. The only way he's going in is flat to the water. <laughs> yep. And you know, everybody's standing around going, shit, I hope I don't have to go in there and get go him and out. Get him, yeah. Yep. Him. So a couple other things that I just wanted to touch on real quick because, um, you know, the Toyota off-road world is the Toyota off-road world, and it, it's kind of its own self-contained entity. But you've been on the trail, obviously, not just with your own Tacoma and with your Forerunner, but with quite a lot of others. So... 
pros cons what can you tell people listening about you know if they want to get into it and are thinking about something from toyota i know you've yeah. been on the trail with i i think i've seen second and third gen tacos in there too yeah we've had second third gen tacos um we've had fifth gen forerunners mm-hmm. um so uh sort of the you know oh land cruisers so um sort of a, a, a bit of a, a selection there um you know, I would say what Tacomas are a great vehicle. Forerunners, uh, Toyotas, really, uh, they're great vehicles to to go exploring in. Um, uh, what and there's pros and cons to older and newer ones, right? Like the older ones are narrower; they're maybe cheaper, <laughs> uh, depending on yeah. <laughs> on uh, what you get. Um, as long as it's not a third gen Forerunner with the manual and the and the factory. That's right. Lot. That's right factory locker yeah you know as long as and and depending on how much work you want to put into it um so uh but of course you know with being older there's there's less aftermarket support for them they're uh what uh they're not as comfortable maybe on the trail as a as a newer newer tacoma or newer forerunner so um boy make that make that sort of balanced trade-off for yourself i i would say if you're if you don't have a vehicle try them all, right? Like it doesn't yep. hurt to go test drive an old one and a new one and see which one, which one you're happy with. Um, they'll all do just fine on the trail. Uh, there might be certain trails you, you can't run or, or maybe won't be as comfortable running with a, with a later model just because of approach and departure angles and width of the vehicle. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but for the most part, you know, the, the third gens can the third gen Tacomas can run all the same trails as a first gen Tacoma. Mm-hmm. You might get a little bit more pinstriping kind of thing, but uh, uh, they're all they're all really great vehicles. And you know, frankly, like I'm sure there are tons of other really great vehicles. We see tons of Jeeps out there doing their thing, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and they all seem to be having a great time too. So yep. um, uh, our our opinion is as long as you're not in a uh, in a UTV. You're probably good. <laughs> you can probably see my picture. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know which one I'm pointing to. I think that's the white one. That's my brother's Can-Am and my dad's Polaris Razor is over on the other side. Yeah. Uh, UTV drivers, there is no Venn diagram overlap little area. There's just the good and the bad. I, I, have, I think that's totally right. There's really what it is are there's UTV drivers who – sort of got to UTVs from the off-road world and sort of understand how that works. Yep. And then and then there are UTV drivers who got to UTVs because they thought, oh, this will be a cool way to go ripping around in the woods, and they don't really know what they're doing. You're 100% And, right. and they're just messing everything up. Yep. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of people fall into that second bucket mm-hmm. um, just because it's an easy way to get out there with their toy hauler and – and their toy and go right. tear it's up. i hate lumping people into categories even though i literally just did but it's it comes down to like the off-roaders and the people who use off-roading to go places and see things and then just the people who are like like you said you know fun little thing to do and it's, yep. it's not it's not for the hobby or the experience or you know or what can be seen or the you know the the off-road ability and the and the crazy engineering that comes with some of it it's just oh look i can mesh the gas pedal that's those right are the, those are the people that tend to be problematic yeah yeah but so let's talk trip reports because sure i mean chris and i both write for universe you know chris and he's been writing as longer probably maybe longer than i have i won't say anything <laughs> else because he's gonna virtually punch me um but but I'm much older than ross <laughs> <laughs> well uh, you guys both look much younger than me so that's fine <laughs> well i'm, I'm years on ross, so. yeah i'm coming out of, on 30 and my wife is reminding me like every i don't know 12 hours even though she's only a week younger than me so <laughs> but when you get closer to 40 your own body does the reminding for you uh, <laughs> sure dude i I'm feeling it already. Two Saturdays ago, I had I drank beer with my brother on a Saturday night. We had the same number of beers. He's 24. He woke up the next day and was like 100% like fucking 
gummy, like sprung back. And I woke up and I, I had the worst hangover I've had in like two years. Oh. And I was just from keeping up with my, you know, five year younger brother. Um, but yeah, tangent. Anyways, yeah, yeah, Dan, I want to know about the trip reports because you write the most like crazy documented and research trip reports and it's, yeah. it's wild and i i've tried to emulate that on tacoma world once upon a time and like that wasn't even that was for day trips <laughs> you know <laughs> for the audio listener right now actually all listeners are audio um you should try to find the youtube version of this because i've just been constantly sharing trip report photos through the whole show yep. all the places dan's gone so yeah. so what's your uh what's your process what's the yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we touched on it a little bit, uh, when we were talking about taking photos. So, you know, the first part, well, the first part of any trip report is figuring out the, the route you're going to take. Right. Um, uh, and then, but once you're on that route, uh, a trip report without photos is a trip report that no one looks at. So, um, in fact, you know, my guess is that of the people who look at my trip reports, uh, the way most of them look at it is with their thumb scrolling through their phone, just <laughs> looking at the photos as they go right. by. Uh, I remember really... once upon a time on Expedition Portal, I was I opened something and the just the title of the thread was so good and I was so excited to read it. And then I clicked it and it was like, there are no pictures. It was three blocks of paragraphs that were like fucking yeah. four scrolls each. Just like okay, somebody yeah. doesn't get it. Yeah. So, um, so, so anyway, so that means that the, the important thing for any trip report is to have lots of photos. Um, and so, you know, when you're on a trip, stop and take photos. A lot of folks get into the driving or they just feel like, Oh, I don't want to get out of the truck. And, you know, a photo, a photo can be right next to the truck or it can be, you know, several hundred feet in front or behind the truck to get, you know, if you want to get, uh, some landscape with the truck in it. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I sort of joke with my wife that the truck is our roaming gnome, our travelocity <laughs> roaming gnome. So, uh, you know, that ends up nice. in a lot of pictures. So um, uh, take a bunch of pictures. Um, always, always err on the side of stopping. Uh, you're there to see stuff. That's why you're on the trip. So, so stop and, and look at it. Don't feel like you have to rush through it. Uh, every trip has too much in it to ever see everything. Uh, so see however much you can, um, and then come back and see the rest. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, while I'm on a trip, um, if it's more than just a couple days, I will take notes during the day as I'm, uh, as I'm going along, mm -hmm. um, uh, both where I'm like where I am, uh, a lot of times a picture can sort of trigger that, yeah. um, when you're back writing a trip report, but, uh, you know, names of places that you might pass, um, uh, the photo doesn't generally have a name in it. So it's nice to be able to say, this is a, the name of the place. Um, and, Do you take and, the notes on your phone or like you literally handwrite them in a book? Uh, I take notes on my phone. Um, I, uh, I just dictate into OneNote. Uh, right. And so that's super nice because I don't have to be like typing with my thumbs. I can just press the microphone button and, and say, you know, I'm somewhere, uh, mm -hmm. wherever it is. And half the time it'll get it right. But, you know, <laughs> all the time, if I go back and say it out loud, it'll be the right thing, mm. um, uh, even if it's the wrong words. So <clears throat> um, so I dictate into the phone just just bullets. Uh, I don't I don't write paragraphs or anything at that point. Uh, just bullets are sort of where I am. Or uh, a lot of times if you're on groups of people, there'll be some fun conversation that goes on uh, over the, the CB radio. And so. I will, I will sometimes take notes of, of interesting things that happen during the day or quotes that I think, oh, that'd be a fun quote to put into the trip report mm -hmm. um, when I get back. And uh, so anyway, I probably end up with, I don't know, between 10 and 20 sort of bullets uh, for each day of notes. Um, and, uh, and so then when I get back uh, at the end of a trip, um, I pretty tr quickly try and get through uh, sort of the process of copying photos off of the camera onto the computer, uh, going through those and sort of figuring out which are the ones I want to keep, and um, and then writing the trip report. Um, I try and do that reasonably quickly, uh, just so that things are fresh in my mind. Um, uh, but then also for me personally, uh, so that I don't fall behind, because I know mm -hmm. you know it's one thing to go through uh, a few hundred pictures. 
and write a trip report. It's another to know, oh, I've got eight of those trips to go through right. still. <laughs> yeah, and if you guys are doing one a month, I mean, Jesus. Yeah, like... and so if you've got, you know, a couple thousand pictures and six trip reports, then you sort of, sort of feel like, oh, man, uh, maybe I'll just, yeah, I'll just procrastinate that a little longer. So um, I, try and, I try and get it done uh, as quickly as I can. Um, you know, I've got the nice side effect of, of having the, the build thread on Tacoma World where I sort of put everything... Uh, and the and the blog where I put everything and and uh, and so what I I also sort of want to always have content that I'm able to put into that that stream so it's kind of nice uh, to get it done and just know that it's it's ready to go queued up there um, right. so so yeah sitting down to write a trip report is not a it's not a fast process um, probably you know in a to do one day all of the photo processing and the writing. Uh, it's probably, I don't know, five, six hours of work to yep. do that. And Sounds so cool. for a, for a week long trip, um, you know, you're looking at, uh, a good few days of, of work, uh, mm -hmm. to get that, to get that all written up. Um, and, and I don't try and do it all in one day. So I actually, um, I first process all the photos and sort of develop them, uh, in Lightroom mm -hmm. that usually takes. Uh, an hour or two per day of photos that I that I shot, um, and then I'll try and do the trip report. I'll try and write one day per day. So if mm -hmm. it's a two week trip, it'll take me two weeks to write the trip report for that trip because um, mm -hmm. I just get sick of of writing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. and so I, I sort of break that up over over time, um, and so writing a day a day sort of makes me feel like oh yeah, that's something totally doable. Mm -hmm. Um, and it allows me to do other stuff during the day. Like if I want to do some truck maintenance or hang out with the family or do it, clean up from last that's trip. right. That. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's my, my mode of, of writing trip reports. Um, but like I would say, uh, the, the most important thing is going out there and having fun. Uh, mm -hmm. the thing everybody wants to see are photos. So even if you just post trip reports that are photo threads, uh, everybody loves those. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I would say, even if you're not doing trip reports, stop as much as you can and take as many pictures as you can because that's why you're out there anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed, hundred uh, percent. With my you know limited experience of yeah. doing so, <laughs> one of the Which things I like about taking. With? Good question, Sorry, Russ. That's okay. Go ahead, Dane. What camera do you shoot with? Uh, yeah, so I shoot um, I shoot now with a Canon 80D uh, DSLR. Nice. Um, and, uh, and what I, I think, um, as important as, as the body itself are the lenses. I use a 18 to, lenses. yeah, I use an 18 to 135, uh, USM lens, which is a really nice, it's a pretty heavy, um, fast autofocus lens. I don't know that I really need it to be fast, uh, mm -hmm. given that most of the pictures are landscape, but it's pretty crisp and. <laughs> Yep. And uh, there's some motion with the trucks coming through on the shots. Though. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, that's probably 80% of the pictures are with that lens. And then I've got a wide angle 10 to 18 that uh, mm -hmm. is really nice for like skies and things like that. Uh, you get a nice effect with the clouds. Yep. So um, uh, those are the only two lenses I use um, on the camera. And then uh, I process everything in, in Lightroom. Um, uh, when I get home. So it, it seems like a great camera, but, but really like any, uh, any camera that shoots in raw, yeah. uh, is mm -hmm. probably pretty, is probably just fine. Um, uh, and, and frankly, like the newer phones are probably great too. In fact, I started the very first trip I was on, uh, I had a Google pixel. So, you know, four or five <laughs> years ago, Google pixel was like the premier phone camera. Right. And yeah, I was like, they were the groundbreaking camera changed yeah. camera phones. And, uh, and all the other guys had, had DSLRs and, and they were giving me a hard time for, you know, doing everything on the phone. I was like, Oh man, this is the greatest camera ever guys. Like this is going to be no problem. Of course <laughs> I got back and my photos were nowhere near as nice mm -hmm. as theirs, but, um, uh, you know, shooting on a phone also gives you um, a lot of practice at doing framing really nicely because you don't have the same ability to zoom uh, or, and frame the way that you do on a DSLR. So uh, mm -hmm. even just shooting with a camera, like you get a lot of practice of, of figuring out how to take really nice photos. So 
whatever you're shooting with, you can get you can get nice photos. I think. Yep. Yep. And just the last thing that I was going to say before we uh, move on to the last last bit, and then I, I unfortunately have to go is uh, one of the great things about taking pictures is that you generally get out of the truck and generally can take like even if it's five seconds to just look around you know because yeah. if you're driving on the truck you can look in the mirrors you can turn around to an extent but it's it's limited you come to a stop you get out you walk around you can like you'll see some, see things that you otherwise just would have driven past absolutely and i fucking love taking like a deep breath of you know of like mountain air or like wherever it is just the air of where i'm standing because it, it's you know it's it's different it's it it like enhances the experience as cheesy as that sounds. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's totally true. Getting out of the truck is, is just so nice. And really for me, it's one of the things, uh, I noticed that if I stay, stay in the truck, you know, my back will start to ache by the end of the day and that kind of thing, just getting out of the truck every, you know, a few times an hour for a couple minutes to look around really, really solves all that problem too. Yep. Yep. So, just in the sake of wrapping this up soon, since yeah. again, East Coast time, um, unfortunately, <laughs> is uh, where uh, I mean, you've you've gone endless places. You got a list and a list and a list. Where uh, where's where's top of your still to go list? Yeah. So, um, boy, the, I, I say uh, this every time I go somewhere, I always want to go back. Um, so it seems like my list is, is never shrinking and never, uh, I'm never getting places off of the list. I'm mm-hmm. just adding, I'm, I'm zeroing in on more places, uh, the more places I go, but really for me, um, a couple of places that I haven't been enough that I really want to go are Canada and Alaska. Yeah. Um, I've been to Canada, uh, twice now, um, and it's just amazingly beautiful up there. And, yeah. and at least for me, um, there's the part of the problem with Canada is like, it seems harder to find places to go. <laughs> the um, places you want to go are like more densely populated and yeah. not, not necessarily population densely populated, but densely populated in terms of attractions, it seems. Yeah. And you know, everybody's trying to hone in on those. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really like, I think a lot of the, the good trails in Canada are sort of, um, what the, the locals know them, but they're not sort of on the internet in the same way that they are in the U S and so it's harder they to research. Brutal too. Yeah. Um, so in Alaska, I'd just love to go to Alaska in general, whether it's off-roading or just touristing. Yeah. yeah. It's one <laughs> um, of the few so, places I wouldn't feel bad about just flying to and yeah. just like, you know, doing some of the tourist stuff because you can't see, I, I can't see that anywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So those are two places. Um, I've really gotten into over the last few years, Death Valley. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great place to go. Um, you know, being from the Pacific Northwest, it's a great place to place to get out of winter during the winter. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's nice to go down there and, and sort of not be in the snow. Uh, I'm not a huge snow wheeler. Um, so, so I now find that like, um, what I can spend a day or a week or even longer than a week, like in a small region of Death Valley and still mm. not see everything. So uh, uh, headed down there is, that's always a fun thing for me. Okay. Um, and then and then I like to sort of see a lot of stuff and that means going on long dirt roads. So there's still a bunch of backcountry discovery routes that I'd love to do just to sort of get a sense of the lay of the land. Mm-hmm. Uh, Continental Divide Trail, which sort of strings together some backcountry discovery routes. Yep. Uh, you know, trails like that are super interesting to me. It turns out they're super interesting to me because they usually lead to more than that. Um, and so, uh, and so those, those are some places in of themselves. It's that's the right. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Learn, learning the area, you know, Nevada, we did this backcountry discovery route this summer and, and we now have, uh, tons of places that we want to go back to. Cause we were like, Oh, that looks cool. And we don't have time to do it right now. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, you know, you think of Nevada as this like big open nothingness, but it turns out, man, some of the coolest petroglyphs we've seen, uh, and, you know, nicest rock formations, uh, they're not in Utah, they're in Nevada. Um, Interesting. And so, yeah. I mean, we went to a place uh, in Nevada that had, um, uh, just this amazing sort of candy cane striped rocks. Um, uh, and it was, it was spectacular. 
Yeah. Okay. I have to circle back and read that. I mean, <laughs> we have a little bit of geology. I mean, Chris taught geology. I minored in geology, so it's it's that's kind of uh, that's an attraction in of itself. Yeah. Yeah. We did a trip to uh, the Eastern Mojave. Uh, I think is how I sort of titled it uh, on the on the on the blog. Uh, it's definitely one worth checking out if you're into geography and rocks and stuff. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yep. Um, and I see your note about the Northeast. If you come to the Northeast, go to Maine and then leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, there's cool stuff in New Hampshire and Vermont and like way upstate New York, but generally the good stuff is Maine. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, the Midwest and Northeast, they're, they're places that are going to be very different than what I'm used to out here in the West. And I'd love to just see them, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know how much, you know, that there'd be years and years of stuff to, to go do there. Like, like it feels like there is in death Valley for me, but just, There's just that. going through and seeing it, I think would be super interesting. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, if it's outside and it's different than what I've seen, it's going to be great for me. So yeah. 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 Fall is the time to come to the Northeast. I know everybody says that and it's cliche as cliche gets, but fall is the time. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. As as it looks like it is in Colorado. So. Oh, Colorado is great in the fall. Although you know, I've been I've been uh, posting this trip. We just did a trip to Colorado for two weeks, and I've been been posting it uh, here the last few weeks. And uh, and it was great colors. You know, the aspens were all yellow while we were there. Um, but other folks then you know share pictures of when they were there uh, in you know June, July, and it's just it's all everything's all green. Right. Uh, yeah. All the grass on the hills and everything, and man, that looks beautiful too. So, so maybe I need to go back. Also, not during the fall. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> different experience, same place. That's different right. experience, always yeah. fun. Yeah. Cool. So, on that note, um, plug your stuff. I know uh, you, uh, you have your site. Yeah. So uh, my site is uh, adventuretaco.com, and uh, I. I post up there pretty regularly. I've got all my trip reports uh, go up there and, as well as any, you know, truck mods and gear reviews and things like that. Um, uh, I just try and try and get it all or try and get it all out there for people to read. Um, it's all my stuff. I'm not like a sponsored guy. I don't have a big Instagram channel or anything. Um, uh, I really just like doing it and it started off. My family liked to read it and I needed somewhere to put it. So um, so anyway, I, I like being that way because I can say whatever I want to say and not have to worry. Uh, <laughs> no so, obligations. So, yeah, so that's adventuretaco.com. And then of course I do still have, uh, Instagram, which I don't post very much on, um, it's go adventure taco. So, okay. uh, folks are welcome to head over there and I try and share stuff onto Facebook as well. Uh, that's also adventure taco on Facebook. Um, but really that's just to point people so they can go read it on the blog and I'll put go anything new on Facebook, uh, as compared to the blog. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, head on over there. Cool. If, uh, you want to see some trip reports, I'm sure people will. I have been browsing <laughs> them the entire show and I've loved all of it. Yeah, great. <laughs> I, I especially like you, it seemed like each, after each trip, you do a, a kind of like a wrap up of like what worked well on the truck, what didn't work well on the like, yeah, yeah. yeah about a year cool. ago, um, about a year ago, maybe maybe eighteen months ago, I started doing these things that I called rig reviews because I realized, you know, people people write about their mods or they you know show off the mods that they do uh, on their vehicles and they might do a trip report here and there, but they never really say like, did that modification work? Right. Uh, <laughs> what didn't work? Um, and so um, these rig reviews are a nice way for me to sort of take stock of the truck. How are things doing? It gets back to the sort of my advice to everyone else of like, go on a trip and then figure out what you need mm -hmm. for the next trip. Um, this is my way of doing that for my truck. Um, and so, uh, and so, yeah, I, I don't do them after every trip, but I do probably do them uh, at least once a quarter after every two or three trips mm -hmm. uh, and sort of say, yep, here are the things that are working well. Uh, here are the things that could be better. And, and I sort of follow through on that. So I, if something uh, is a problem. I'll try and solve it by the next rig review and, and I'll give mm -hmm. an update on how I solved it. Um, or, uh, uh, if something's really good, yeah, I guess there's no follow up to that. I'll just say, Hey, here's a really great thing. You know, <laughs> this, this tent works really well in this situation, or these skid plates have saved my truck numerous times, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. 
Yeah. Things worse the work the way that I was told they were gonna work. That's right. <laughs> it's not the best. <laughs> like, oh, I spent this money and I spent this time and it actually is paying off. Yeah, totally. So yeah, that's it. I think uh I don't Chris, you got anything else? No, that's a I literally feel like hopping in the truck and driving right now. So same. Oh my god. <laughs> same. Especially like I I 100% identify with the, I spent a little time in Southern Utah and I feel like I missed so much already. And I spent five days exploring, but I just, I want to go back. Well, I, I'll, uh, I'll meet you out there for it, my first time next year. And it wasn't Moab. Like I was in <laughs> yeah. really Southern Utah. Like it was nowhere. Yeah. 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 Southern Utah is a great place. Like Death, Death Valley's definitely on the list. The Mojave Trail. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I feel, I feel like I do Mojave before I ever think about the Rubicon. <laughs> Same. Oh my god. Uh, yeah, Mo- Mojave. I mean, they're totally different, different beasts. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, Mojave's pretty much any road, right? Uh, well, so there's the, okay. I mean, I know you. Sorry, I know you got to go, Ross. <laughs> That's <but>. okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is all bucket list shit for me. So tell me. Okay, tell, so tell so Mojave. Um, uh, in twenty, I guess it was twenty eighteen. Right at the end of twenty eighteen, one of my buddies uh, who lived down in Arizona at the time helped me uh, do a bunch of work on the rear rear suspension of the Tacoma. Um, uh, I basically, I went away from the stock suspension to a relocated suspension setup that, that I was going to get a bunch more travel with. And I was really looking forward to, uh, testing it out on the Mojave road right after I sort of did the work with him. And in fact, my wife flew down, flew down to Vegas and I picked her up and then we were going to do the Mojave road and drive home. Uh, so we did the Mojave Road. The suspension, it didn't work at all. I actually ended up <laughs> taking the shocks off and running just leaf springs oh my God. Uh, oh, wow. for the entire road. Oh. Um, and which, you know, it just meant we had to go a little slower. Um, but uh, so we did the Mojave Road and, and it was cool. Uh, but the next year we went down and, and sort of explored the preserve some more. And, and the cool stuff is, is not the road. The road gets all the fame, but man, the rest of the preserve is amazing. Uh, and so I recommend um, getting off of the Mojave Road and, and sort of exploring. There's uh, maybe eight uh, major mountain range areas, mm-hmm. and each of them have roads that go up into them that go to just amazing uh, mines and sites. And um, That sounds awesome. And totally way better than the road. The road gets so much traffic that everything on the road is sort of picked over. Um, mm-hmm. You know, even as people are trying to be careful, uh, you know, they're touching stuff and picking it up and yeah. walking around it, that kind of thing. Uh, you get off off the road uh, a little ways, and it's <laughs> it's way cooler. <laughs> okay, Sounds noted. Like me with my boys when we're out, I'm like, stop touching stuff. Like, leave it. Stop touching. Right. All right. Leave no trace. That's right. All right. Well, ho- I mean, shit, hopefully we can overlap a trip at some point and, you know, yeah, see some stuff. Cool. Yep. Yeah, by, the, by the time I show up with Dan, I, I want a first read. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I, that might be, my, like, my biggest gripe about going out to have a find ice. Like, hey, yeah. Well, if you're getting a trailer, I mean, you're going to have to get a fridge because you don't want to get ice with a trailer. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. How can you keep the beer cold? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, seriously. Okay. Well, Dan, thank you for joining us. Absolutely.